Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, a Lucasfilm LTD production, a Steven Spielberg film, novelization by James Kahn, adapted from the screenplay by Willard Hugh Hick and Gloria Katz, based on a story by George Lucas. Chapter 1 Out of the Frying Pan Shanghai, 1935 The nightclub had that wild and smoky air. Ladies and gentlemen, and not so gentle men of every nationality, and some no nation would claim, sat, formerly attired, at tables that were scattered around the dance floor. Cigarette girls with long legs, bouncers with long faces, excited food, tuxedoed waiters, laughter, soft and loud, champagne and broken promises, and opium lacing, some of the tobacco that was the flavor to the smoke. A decadent place in a time of deep decay, but still, tres gay eye like the last party before the apocalypse. In a few years, the world would be at war. Along the side wall, deco curves and oriental arches weaved around to form private booths or step-up balconies. The bar was off to the back. Up front, beside the kitchen doors, stood the bandstand, slightly raised, and beside it, directly before the dance floor, was the stage. Flanking the stage were two giant carved wooden statues, Chinese warlords slouching on their thrones, sporting golden broad swords, smiling coolly as if presiding over these festivities. Beside the stage left statue, an enormous gong hung by two thick cords from the ceiling almost to the floor. In bass relief on, on bass, in bass relief on its face, an angry dragon hovered above a great mountain. Beside the gong stood a muscular attendant in harham pants, the, stir the striker resting across his bare chest. Facing front center stage, its mouth wide open, was the head of a huge dragon. Its great eyes bulged fran fran frantically in different directions. Its papier-mâché antenna quivered in uneasy re renaissance with the clatter of the room. Its paper lantern scales rippled back to the curtains. And now smoke began to issue from its maul. Ceremoniously, the attendant struck the gong. Fire red light suffused the steam filling the dragon's mouth. The smoky light poured down the steps, off the stage, onto the dance floor as the band began playing. And then slowly, through the jaws of the beast, out of its fiery snarl, emerged the woman. She was twenty, maybe twenty-five, green-blue eyes, dark blonde hair, she wore a high-necked, fitted, golden red squeened gown with matching gloves, spike heels, butterfly earrings. She paused at the dragon's lip, reached overhead to tug coyly on one of its upper teeth, then stepped forward with a sultry purr. Her name was Willie Scott. She was a knockout. A dozen girls danced down the stairs that waned the dragon's head. They fluttered fans before their exquisitely painted faces. They wore thigh-length golden kimonos, showing more than a glimpse of silk stocking as Willie started to sing. Ye wan sin wan yin kan dao, ex lean bai yao lon ji bao ji di thai dao, anything goes. The crowd was mostly inattentive, but Willie mostly didn't care. She went through her moves like a pro up the steps and down, growling her song while her mind wandered in the smoke that swirled over the stage, floating thickest around the set creature's head like the dreams of the dragon. In her mind, there, this was no sleazy, Shanghai night spot. It was a grand stage. And these two bit hoofers behind her were a tight chorus line, and it was back in the States, and she was the glamorous star, rich and adored, and dazzling and independent, and the smoke cleared a little. Willie remembered where she really was. Too bad for this mob, she thought. They are too low to appreciate a class act when it taps right up to their table. 
The band leader cued her, and she went into her last chorus, pulling out a red scarf, taunting the audience from behind it. Anything goes. The band wrapped it up. The crowd applauded. Willie bowed. The three men at the front table clapped politely, managing to turn their lips up without smiling. The gangster Lauche and his two sons. Vile scoundrels, dressed in the faintest veneer of Beau Monde. Willie winked at them, or more specifically at Lao Che, who was currently her meal ticket. He nodded back at her, but then something else caught his eye and a shadow held his face. As Willie ran back upstairs and off stage, she followed Lao Che's gaze to see what it was that engendered his disfavor. It was a man entering the club, walking down the staircase at the back of the room. He wore a white dinner jacket with a red carnation in the lapel, black pants, vest, bow tie, shoes. Willie couldn't see much more than that except that the man seemed to carry himself pretty well. He gave her a bad feeling, though. She wondered if he was some kind of cop. She saw him reach the bottom of the stairs where he was greeted by a waiter, just as she made her exit off stage. Her last thought on the matter was, well, he's pretty, but he looks like trouble. Indiana Jones stepped off the elevator and walked down the stairway into the Club Obi-Wan just as the floor show was ending. He watched the twelve red and gold clad dancers scurry out of sight to loud applause, smiled to himself. Hey, don't run off now, ladies. I just got here. Nonchalantly, he finished descending the stairs, but his eyes scanned the room like a charry cat. It was as he remembered it, only more so, the desolate horde, the hollow Reverly. These were the people of a dying tribe. He wondered if even their artifacts would last, if his own counterpart in a thousand years could dig up their boxes and jewelry and picture the life in this room. Picture the low life, that is, he thought, his eyes coming to rest on Lao Che's table. When he reached the bottom of the stairs, a waiter came up to him. The man was young, though his hairline was thinning, slight of build, though there was something dangerous about him. Half Chinese, half Dutch, his name was Wu Han. He bowed slightly to Indiana with a vacant smile of greeting and spoke so that only Jones heard. Be careful. Indy nodded back absently, then walked toward Lao Che's group. They reseated themselves as he approached. The applause ended. Dr. Jones, said Lao Che. Lao Che, said Indiana Jones. Lao was pushing 50. Several layers of high living puffed out his cheeks and belly, but it was all under the surface, like lizard meat. He wore a black silk brocade dinner jacket, black shirt, white tie. His eyes were heavily lidded, reptilian. On his left finger, he wore the gilt signet ring of the royal family of the Chain Dynasty. Indy noted this with professional admiration. To Lao Che's left was his son, Ko Khan, a younger version of the old man, stocky, impassive, ruthless. On Lao Che's right sat his other son, Chen. Chen was tall, thin, almost to the point of ghostliness. The white scarf hanging loosely around his neck made Indy think of the tattered swatting that sometimes clung to long, shriveled corpses. Lao smiled at Indy. Ni Chen Lai, Helma? Chen and Ko Khan laughed malignantly. Indy smiled in return. Wan Jun Hao Ni Na? Wa Huey Hun Jun Chi Ja? Luni Ka So? Wa Shu he turned the joke around on Lao Che. The three seated men became silent. Lao stared at Indy with venom. You never told me you spoke my language, Dr. Jones. I don't like to show off, Indy, dead, pain, dead pained. Two bodyguards appeared, frisked him quickly, and faded out of sight again. He didn't like that, but he'd expected it. He sat down across from Lao. A waiter arrived at the table with a large dish of caviar and a bucket of chilled champagne, which he set beside Lao. The smile returned to the crime lord's face. For this special occasion, I have ordered champagne and caviar. 
He stared at Indy with a strange intensity as he went on. So it is true, Dr. Jones. You found New Hachi. Indy leaned forward slightly. You know I did. Last night, one of your boys tried to take New Hachi without paying for him. Kokon brought his left hand up and rested it on the table. It was newly bandaged. It was newly missing an index finger. Lauchase seethed, nodding. You have insulted my son. Indy sat back. No, you have insulted me, but I spared his life. Lau gazed at Indy like a cobra and a mongoose. Dr. Jones, I want new hachi. He placed a wad of bills on the lazy Susan that occupied the center of the table and spun it around until the money rested in front of Indy. Indy put his hand down on the pile, felt the thickness of the wad, converted his estimate to dollars, came up short. Way short. He revolved the turning table. He revolved the turn table back to Lau and shook his head. This doesn't even begin to cover my expenses, Lau. I thought I was dealing with an honest crook. Ko Khan and Chen swore angrily in Chinese. Chen half stood. Suddenly, an elegant gloved hand rested on Lau's shoulder. Indy let his eyes glide up the smooth arm to the face of the woman standing beside, behind Lau. She stared directly back at Indy. Are you going to introduce us? She said softly. Lao Che waved Chen back down to his seat. Dr. Jones, this is Willie Scott, said Lao. Willie, this is Indiana Jones, the famous archaeologist. Willie walked around toward Indy as he rose to greet her. In the moment of the handshake, they appraised each other. He liked her face. It had a natural be beauty weathered by natural disasters, like a raw gem after a flood, crystal rough and waiting for a setting. She wore a Daphneus butterfly barrette that seemed to grow out of the substance of her hair. Indy took this to indicate a certain extravagance to her personality, if not actual flight flightness. She wore gloves. Indy saw this as a statement on her part. I do a lot of handling, but I don't touch. She wore expensive perfume and a squeened dress cut high in front and low, real low in back. Andy took this to mean she came, in, she came on cool and left you with a nice memory. She was with Lao Che. To Andy, this signaled alarm. Willie saw at once this was the guy she'd noticed coming in at the end of her act. Her initial impression on him was even stronger now. Good looking, but so out of place. The air was practically shattering around the table. She couldn't think for his place. Though, archaeologist, that didn't wash. He had an interesting scar across his chin. She wondered how he'd got it. She was a consigneur of interesting scars. And he sure had nice eyes, although she couldn't quite figure out the color. Sort of green hazel gray sky with gold flecks, clear and hard and finely unreadable. Too bad, really. Anyway, you sliced it. He looked like seven miles of bad road. She let her stare drift from his interesting scar to his, to his unhazel eyes. I thought archaeologists were funny little men always looking for their mommies, she teased. Mummies, he corrected. They sat down. Lau interrupted their brief conversation. Dr. Jones found new Hachi for me and is about to deliver him now. Indy was about to reply when he first felt and then saw the small round mouth of Kokon's gun pointing at him, waiting to speak. Indy didn't want to hear what the pistol had to say, though, so he grabbed a two-pronged carving fork from a nearby trolley as Willie was talking. "'Say who's Nahachi?' she asked innocently, still unaware of the imminent explosion. In the next moment, she became aware. Indiana pulled her close and held the fork to her side. Willie held her breath a moment. To herself, she said, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. To Lau, she said softly but urgently, Lau, he's got a fork on me. Andy spoke in monotone to Ko Khan. Put the gun away, Sonny. He increased the pressure with his weapon. Willie felt the prawns dent her skin. She strove to keep the fear out of her voice. Lau, he's got a fork in me. She didn't think he'd actually use it, but you could never tell with men and their toys. Lao Che gave his son a look. The boy put the gun down. Indy pressed. Now I suggest you give me what you owe me, or anything goes, then to Willie. Don't you agree? 
Yes, she whispered icily. Tell him, Mindy suggested. Pay the man, she told Lau. Without saying a word, Lau took a small pouch from his pocket, put it on the turntable, sent it around to Indy and Willie. Indy motioned to her with his head. She picked with his head. She picked up the sack and emptied a handful of gold coins out onto the table. Indy was stoned face. The diamond, Lau. The deal was for the diamond. Lau smiled, shrugged to defeat, took a squat, took a squat silver box from his vest pocket, put it on the turntable. In the moment that Indiana's eyes were focused on the box, Ko Khan tipped a tiny bottle of white powder into the champagne glass beside him. And as the turntable passed him on its way to Indy, Ko Khan set the glass down on it, next to the coins and the silver box. When the catch arrived before them, Willie opened the box. Inside was a hefty yet delicate diamond. Oh, Lao, she breathed. Diamonds were her delight in Howlin' Demon. They were hard but brilliantly lovely. They were clear. They held every color. They were the magical reflection of her very self. And yet they were immensely practical. A diamond like this could make her... rich and blessedly independent from jerks like the yo-yos at this table. Andy stabbed the fork into the table and picked up the jewel, pushing Willie away on her chair back to her original position. She stared at him frostily. You are a real snake. She finally placed the color of his eyes. He ignored her to examine the gemstone. Perfectly cut, each faucet representing a different plane of the ancient universe, unflawed, unmarred, unyellow. The university had been hunting a long time for this little bauble. Now, hissed Lao Che, bring me new Hachi. Indy waved to Wu Han, the waiter, who'd originally met him at the entrance of the club. Wu Han came forward, a linen napkin draped over his left arm, a tray balanced on his right. In the center of the tray stood a small jade casket. Willie's sense of intrigue was beginning to overcome her anger. Money, coins, jewels, threats, and now this exquisite miniature? Who on earth is this new Hachi, she demanded. Indy removed the small casket from Wuhan's tray, set it on the turntable, rotated it toward Lao Che. Here, he smiled. Here he is. Willie watched it, Willie watched it pass her on its way to Lao Che. Must be kind of a small guy, she muttered. Lao Che, Lao put the canister before him. His sons leaned close. Lao spoke quietly, reverently, almost to himself. Inside this sacred coffin are the remains of Nuhachi, the first emperor of the the first emperor of the Manchu dynasty. And he picked up the champagne glass beside him and lifted it magnanimously in toast. Welcome home, old boy. He drank. Ashes, Willie thought. That's the big deal. Ashes. As far as she was concerned, there was no percentage in dwelling over things past. Present and future were the only tenses that mattered. The rest was supremely boring at best. She began to make up her face. Lao grinned sharply at Indy. And now you will give me back the diamond. The room felt like it was getting a bit warm to Indy. He pulled his collar away from his throat. Are you developing a rare sense of humor or am I going deaf? Lao held up a small blue vial. That caught Willie's eye. More treasure, she wondered. What's that? Antidote snapped Lau. Antidote to what? Andy asked suspiciously. He suddenly had a premonition. To the poison you just drank, Lau sneered. Willie got that worried feeling in her gut, that hell-in-a-handbasket feeling. Poison, she rasped. Lau, what are you doing? I work in this place. But not for long, that feeling told her. Andy put a finger into his champagne and rubbed the glass. A gritty residue coated the bottom. The poison works fast, Dr. Jones, Lau, chuck, Lau cackled. Indy put the diamond on the table, held out his hand. Come on, Lau. Chen picked up the diamond, stared into its glaring depth, smirked with satisfaction, satisfaction, put it back down, rotated the turntable toward his father. On its way past Willie, she picked it off the tray to study it. She never held, she'd never held a diamond this large before, this perfect, it almost hummed in her hand. Lau had lost interest in the stone, though. He was still fixated on the casket before him. 
At last I have the ashes of my honored ancestor. Indy was getting more than impatient. Yellow spots were starting to dance in his vision. The antidote, Lau. Lau ignored him. This wasn't going right. Jones felt shaky, felt his options slipping away. In a flash, he grabbed the fork off the table and held it once more to Willie's ribs. Lau, he rumbled. Lau, she echoed. Lau Che, Ko Khan, and Chen only laughed. You keep the girl, said Lau. I'll find another one. Willie stared at Lau as if she were just now understanding something she'd really known all along. You miserable little hood, she said. Wu Han suddenly stepped forward. Please, he smiled at Lau. They all turned to see, under the tray on his arm, concealed from the restaurant at large, a gun, pointing directly at Lao Che. Good service here, said Indy. That's no waiter, Willie suddenly realized. The fork was still on her side. Everyone was edgy. She didn't know which way to jump. Wu Han's an old friend, murmured Indiana. The game's not up yet, Lao. The antidote. As Andy reached out his hand, there was a loud pop at the next table. They all, t they all turned to look. A sodden American had just opened a bottle of champagne, and the foam was spraying over his two giggling lady companions. Waiters there opened more bottles, more loud reports, more spray, more laughter. Indy returned his attention to his own table. He was feeling increasingly queasy, while next to him, he noticed Wu Han was looking positively pale. Wu Han was looking positively pale. Wu Han, was it, he began, but before he could finish, Wu Han collapsed to the table. It was only then that Indy saw the smoking gun in Chan's hand, withdrawn under a napkin. Indy, gasped Wu Han. As Wu Han fell forward, Indiana stood, grabbed him, and lowered the wounded comrade into his own chair. Don't worry, Wu Han, he whispered. I'm going to get you out of here. Not this time, Indy, the dying man choked. I followed you on many adventures, but now into the great unknown mystery I go first. And so he died. Indiana landed, Indiana, Indy laid his friend's head down on the table. He felt flushed, sweaty. Lau could hardly contain his glee. Don't be so sad, Dr. Jones. You will soon join him. Indy's legs suddenly became quite rubbery and he staggered backwards. Kokon chuckled. Too much to drink, Dr. Jones? Indy stumbled back farther, colliding with the drunk at the next table. Even the deathly gaunt chin smiled to see their startled faces peering dizzily at each other. In a rage, Jones, in a rage, Jones pushed the drunk away, bumping into another waiter who was serving the adjoining table with a trolley serving liquor-soaked flaming pigeons on a skewer. Andy thought, if nothing else, I'm going to wipe that smile off Chen's filthy face. In a single motion, he grabbed the flaming pigeon skewer, whirled around, hurled it at Chen. The skewer buried itself to the fiery pigeon hilt in Chen's chest. There was this long, suspended moment. The crowd's den hushed, so suddenly vaguely aware of its own impending convulsion. The people surrounding Lao's table froze, like a held breath, poised on the vision of this wrath-like Chinese man in a dinner jacket, impelled on a silver spear, flaming birds casting his startled face in a queer and morbid light. Then everything happened at once. Willie screamed reflexively. The woman at the next table, seeing the matched skewer of pigeon flamboya on the trolley beside her, and perhaps wondering who was next in line to get spiked, likewise shrieked. The rest of the restaurant exploded in chaos. Shouts, breaking glass, running, confusion, like the inside of Pandora's box before the lid was removed. Indy dove across the table to grab the small blue tube of antidote, but it skittered over the glassy surface off onto the floor. Indy found himself face to face with Lau. He grabbed the vile gangster by the lapels and snarled hoarsely at him. Ho, Y, G, Fon, Yan, very bad against law person. Ni do ga ki yi spat lao, foreign beggar. Kokon grasped Indy around the neck, but Jones cold cocked him with a left hook. One of Lao's henchmen pulled Indy up from behind and in so doing kicked the bottle blue the vital blue liquid across the floor. Kokon's gun fell under the table. 
A number of issues were racing through Willie's mind at this point. Lau was a scum. She was glad to be rid of. She could forget about keeping her job at this place. She'd been right about this Jones character from the beginning, and if she kept a cool head, she might just get away with the diamond. She stuck her hand into the fray on the table, picked up the diamond. She hardly had time to fill it, though, before Indy and the henchman he was wrestling crashed by her, knocking the jewel out of her hand onto the dance floor. You fool, she gasped, talking simultaneously to Indy and herself, and dove after her fleeting fortune. The band began to play, as if they thought the party was just getting rolling. Indy rolled onto the next table with Lau's guard. The strong arm punched him in the jaw, stunning him. Andy swung back blindly, striking the cigarette girl who'd fallen on top of them. The henchman threw Indy off the table into a dinner trolley that started wheeling from his momentum toward the bandstand. He canneered through the bed lamb like a flying apparition. The wind against his face revived him some, cooled the toxation perspiration on his forehead. The people he passed were starting to look a little distorted to him, though. He saw the vial on the floor, or did he imagine it, but sailed right on by. His flight was halted abruptly by crashing into the bandstand. He got up in time to see Lau's guard about to nab him, so he grabbed the big double bass in time to bash the guard into oblivion. He stood there for a moment getting his bearings when his eyes fell upon the vial lying out there in the midst of the melee. He jumped for it. In that moment, it was kicked away. In the next moment, Indy came up on his hands and knees, facing Willie on her hands and knees. The antidote, said Indy. The diamond, Willie responded. Indy noticed the stone near his hand, but it was immediately kicked between a dozen pairs of legs. Nuts, muttered Willie, crawling out off after it. Indy plowed on in the opposite direction. Lau finally made it past the shouting throng to the front door and shouted. Almost instantly, a cadet of his hoodlums ran in, awaiting instruction. The band, the band played on, the band played on, minus the bass. Right on cue, the twelve dancing girls shuffled gaily out of the dragon's mouth and, and down onto the dance floor. Some party. Indy chose the same cue to push himself up off the floor and into the chorus line. He was feeling quite faint now. The sight of Lau's men pouring through the entrance carrying hatchets gave him a new surge of adrenaline. However, he was able to stumble back over to the bandstand. Three hatchet men hurled, hurled their weapons at him, but he ducked behind one of the statues. Quickly, he grabbed a symbol and sold it back at, the, at a fourth hatchet bearer, hitting the assassin in the head, knocking him out cold. Knocking him very cold, in fact. The thug slumped into a huge ice bucket, scattering the ice cubes all over the floor. All over the diamond, Willie moaned with frustration, scrabbling through hundreds of ice nuggets, searching desperately for the now camouflaged diamond. What she found was the blue vial. From the stage, Indy saw her pick it up. Stay there, he yelled at her. Please. Their eyes met. It was a moment of decision for Willie. Who was this guy? He'd come into her life ten minutes ago, come on to her, held a fork on her, given her a touch of her first major league precious stone, cost her her man, no loss, and her job, no sweat, and now she held his life in her hand, and he did have those eyes. She stuck the vial down the front of her dress for safekeeping. But no way was she going to stop looking for that diamond. She trudged off once more through the piles of ice. Kokon woke up. He found his gun on the floor, turned slowly, saw Indy. Still a bit unsteady, he raised the gun to fire across the room. Indy saw him in time, though. He backed up the side of the stage, pulled the release row painting there, and then madly, with dream slowness and a sense of disjointed dream logic, balloons began floating down from the ceiling. Hundreds of colored balloons. Kokon lost sight of his target behind the curtain of this stately barrage. They obscured everything in their steady, deliberate drift. Indy moved laterally toward the pa toward the place where toward the place Willie had recently occupied. No Willie there, though. Only two more thugs. One karate chopped him, but he put the goon down with a jab to the solar plex. He threw uh, he threw the other one into an angry waiter and slumped against the balcony wall. The poison was eating him up. He felt ashen, pale, trembly. His stomach was cramping, and he and he his stomach was cramping, and he wanted to pass out. No, 
No, we had to find Willie. He had to get the vial. He threw a glass of cold water on his face. It helped a little. This was beginning to turn into a real situation now. He saw four more gang members run in. Kokon, meanwhile, was in a fury. He wanted his brother's murderer dead, but his arm was still shaking too much to get off a clear shot. Fortunately, he noticed that one of his gang cohorts was carrying a machine gun. Man Manically, he raced over to the stairs, took the weapon from the man, and walked into the confusion, shouting, Where is he? I'll kill him. People who saw the gun started to scatter. The balloons were thinning out. Now, now too, in a few moments, Kokon and Indy saw each other. As Cal began to shoot, Indy dove over the ledge of the balcony near the huge hanging gun. Bullets tore into the balcony. Indy huddled behind the great bronze, stat bronze shield. People were screaming, hitting the floor, heading for cover. When the first burst was over, Indy leapt over to the statue of the lounging warrior, pulled the golden broadsword from its hand, and with two quick slashes cut the cords that suspended the giant gun from the ceiling. It dropped to the floor with a resounding chung. He jumped down behind it as bullets entered its bronze face. Then sheltering himself on its back side, he slowly wheeled it across the floor toward, wh toward where Willie was still scurrying furiously. Machine gun bullets kept clanging against the surface of Indy's enormous shield. As it rolled, it gained momentum. He had to run to stay hidden. It made a monster noise, this lumbering gun deflecting the gunfire. Willie heard the awesome sound and looked up to see the mammoth disc bearing down on her. So this is it, he thought, crushed by a renegade gun during a cabaret riot. And he grabbed her arm at the last second, though, pulling her behind the shield with him. Bullets Rico headed as Lau's men jockeyed for better firing positions among the overturned tables. Willie hollered, and he looked ahead. Directly before them stood an entire panel of floor-to-ceiling stained glass windows. She shouted, I don't want, but there was no time to debate. The rolling gong crashed through the towering panes a moment later, and he grabbed Willie around the waist and dove with her through the opening. It was free fall for ten feet, followed by a tumble down a slope and tiled roof and then over the edge. Their entwined bodies plummeted two more stories, ripping through a second floor awning, smashing through a bamboo balcony, finally thudding to, 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 the, to rest in the back seat of a convertible Duesenberg parked directly in front of the building. Willie set up in a hurry, completely amazed to be alive, to find herself staring into the equally astonished face of a 12-year-old Chinese boy wearing a New York Yankees baseball cap, staring back at her from the front seat. Wow, holy smoke! Crash landing, said Short Round. Step, in it, step on it, Short Round, said Indy, rising more slowly. Okie dokie, Indy, said the kid. Hold on to your potatoes. With a, with a great grin, Short Round swiveled around, turned his baseball cap bill backwards, and stepped on the gas. Tires squilling, they tore off into the Shanghai night.